I'm Jackie Lockie, your financial planning maestro. This series of podcasts is aimed at financial planning professionals and also those who are looking to enter the financial planning profession. We will be talking during the podcast about all things Certified Financial Planner certification related, talking to other CFPs around the world, And also, we will be dropping in on some new entrants who've just entered the financial planning profession, and we'll be checking up along the way on a regular basis with them to see how they're getting on. I hope you enjoy today's podcast. Hello and welcome. I'm Jackie Lockie, your financial planning maestro. And in today's podcast, we are talking about all things Certified Financial Planner related. And I have a very special guest with me, and that is Anik Sharma from Mercury Wealth Management. Hello, Anik. Hey, Jackie. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks. What about you? I'm very well, thank you. Um, Thanks for joining me today. Um, We are here to talk about your journey gaining Mm -hmm. your Certified Financial Planner Assessment Pass, um, and also all the sorts of questions relating around the subject, tips for people who are thinking about part of, you know, undertaking the process, maybe people who are struggling in the process, but also uh, wider aspects of the knock-on effects, hopefully positive knock-on effects, (laughs) from gaining your CFP certification earlier in the year. So I'm going to dive right in with a few questions that I've got for you to get us nattering. Um, tell us a little bit about how you got into the financial planning profession. Um, I feel like I'm one of the very few who actually aim for it. Whenever you speak to people, they always say they fell into it. Mm. Um, I had a background in academia. So I had a published white paper for my postgrad research looking at cerebral hemodynamics in rugby players. Um, it's basically just looking at the blood flow. And I was actually going to go on to do my PhD, but I had a last minute change of heart. You know, academia wasn't for me, um, the lifestyle, et cetera. And I've always been aware of the financial planning profession um, from my own father and a close friend of mine was a power planner at the time. So I made an active decision to just go into it without any background information. Wow. I know. <laughs> um, I initially applied for a local job, but got rejected, which, you know, I was about 20, 21 at the time, maybe. I took really hard, but you know, got back out there and eventually landed my first career job. Well, that's fantastic. And, you know, we're not talking about very long ago, are we? <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. So it, was it, did you say it was about four years or so that it's taken you to get to where you are now? Yeah, absolutely. So from my very first exam, hour one to CFP and a fellow with a CII, like you say, four years. So wow. it's been a pretty intense four years, to say the yeah, least. I bet. Yeah, no social <laughs> life whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. No, my family and friends have, you know, been a bit excluded from me. Oh. Um, I recently took them out for a meal just to say thank you for your support and sorry for not being around, which is nice. Oh, that's a fantastic gesture. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. And so... What so which what roles did you have along the way? I mean, you you know you did you manage to get a, your first role was it administration or did you manage to get a power planning role? Yeah, so I actually joined a firm called Brook Dobson Breer or BDB based in Harrogate as an analyst. Um, there, I was doing typical power planning work, but I've very quickly moved into client meetings and driving client meetings. Um, so as an analyst, it was a bit of a hybrid between a financial planner and power planner. I realise I'm probably quite lucky because not many people get to go into a client-facing role within a very short space of time. Yeah. And it was great when I was there. Um, I had a really good time, good client exposure, great people. But after an event, I realised time is more important to me. And I was commuting 90 minutes each way, which became a bit too much. Mm. Um so I made the decision to move and within this profession, as you know, you quickly find out who the good people are. Yeah. And by that, I mean those doing four or five holistic financial planning instead yeah. of you know, the traditional transactional bits of advice. Yeah. Where I don't think there's that much value for clients. Um, so I reached out to Oliver at Mercury Wealth Management because I knew of the good stuff they do. And it's very much a company I wanted to be aligned with. And I joined as a certified financial planner back in May this year. Wow. Gosh. 
So that's, I mean, it's a huge amount of both knowledge, but also skills, isn't it, to be become a certified financial planner in such a short space of time. I mean, no wonder your family probably barely <laughs> recognise you. You've probably got four years of making up to do, matey. Um, <laughs> But, you know, ha- what's the journey been like, you know, sitting? I mean, I guess you've been a serial exam taker in all that time, mm-hmm. haven't you, pretty much? Yep. Um, it's been hard. I'm not going to say it's easy. Um, constantly revising, missing out on family occasions, but it's been worthwhile. I suppose what really helped me is when I was you know, at BDB, they lived and breathed the CFP in the way of doing financial planning. Yeah. You know, the holistic version. So I understand for a lot of people, it can, it can be quite difficult because there's a whole new way of doing things. For me, it wasn't the case. I was doing it day in, day out, which really helped in my studying. Yes. Um, with my academic background as well, I'm a bit of a geek at heart. I quite enjoy that white nickel time of revising and getting my head down. So it wasn't too bad. <laughs> Yeah, the truth's coming out now. Truth's coming out now. <laughs> and so, uh, so it, was it? I guess it, it was at Brooks Dobson, Bria, that you came across Certified Financial Planner initially. And then, was it at that point you thought actually, you know, when you started to get, um, you know, go into client meetings and talk mm-hmm. to clients and start building those relationships, was it at that point you thought actually, you know, I need to put CFP on my agenda for the end of all of these other exams that I'm doing? Yeah, great question. Um, to be fair, from day one, at, uh, when I was in Harrogate, the CFP was always on the card. So Andrew Brook Dobson was, he was either the chair or on the board of the previous IFP. Yes, he was on the board, and yeah. One of the early practitioners of adopting the holistic financial planning way. So it was ingrained within the DNA. So with that being my first job, my first career job in the profession, I didn't really know any different. And it was always a case of, I'll do my RO exams. And from there, I will just go and do my CFP. Um, I was quite lucky to have Andrew and Matt around who were both CFPs. So I was constantly learning and getting their view and perspective of the CFP way of thinking. Yeah. And what's interesting in an environment like that is that you're not, you don't have to undo knowledge about product sales or different ways of doing it if you because you've kind of gone in like you said in the kind of right home of financial planning initially yeah exactly um i talk to a lot of people and for them it's quite difficult coming from a background of sales and you know products to get to this new way of thinking of financial planning and putting the financial plan first and you know the instruments and products second yeah um it's probably easier from my perspective, I suppose, because yeah. I haven't had to undo all that different yeah, way of thinking. Yeah. So you you passed all your RO exams and then did you go straight on to the CFP? Was it just kind of right, tick that box <laughs> and let's just crack on with it? Or did you have a little pause between the two? Um, I finished all my RO exams. I went on to my AF exam still with the CII. Um, and then when I finished, my last AF exam, I went straight into the CFP. Um, <laughs> I think during, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think during COVID, I had about a three or four month gap, and I found it really, really hard to pick up a textbook again. So I sort of said to myself, "I'm not going to lose momentum again. I'm just going to keep on going." Keep going, yeah. Um, yeah. From one of the early days, I realised the CFP is an internationally recognised qualification. And as someone who's relatively young in the profession, it's important that I am highly qualified. So it was never a question of if, when I get to CFP, but more when. Yeah. So it just made sense to carry on going and, you know, not see my family for a little bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your experience. So you sat the level six exam then, did you? Yes, sat the level yep. six exam. Um managed to pass that um it's interesting i back myself with my exams and my exam marks probably show but there's always that nervousness of waiting for the exam results to come back in and that's something that hasn't changed throughout my entire journey yeah um yep sat the exam passed it and straight into level seven and that's when i got in contact with you because you know talking to different people in the profession something i do a lot 
it, it, level seven is a different beast completely. Yeah. And it absolutely makes sense to go out and talk to different people and just touch base with those who know what they're doing. And so we obviously you embarked on a course. Um, <laughs> uh, we had lots of fun along the way. Tell, tell our listeners about your experience of how you approached your case study mm-hmm. and how you kind of got your head around it all and to tackle it. Um, so I know it can seem scary. I think once you chunk it down, it's not too bad. Um, however, this is coming from a place where I didn't think my 30,000 word thesis was too bad either. <laughs> um, I quite, I love the analytical jigsaw. Um, and with any big project, it's important to break it down. If you try and tackle it in one go, it will absolutely consume you and you'll be overwhelmed and it won't work. Yeah. Yeah. Little and often, I find, is the best route to go about it. And as you say, I undertook one of your coaching courses, which was really, really useful in providing the structural bones to my analysis. Um, you're very experienced and you live and breathe this, so it would be very foolish to not take on your um, wisdom you have with it. Thank you, you very much. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> <are> you? <laughs> um, I started looking at training videos and made a load of notes before the case study was released, I think, I think my case study was released in December twenty two. That feels about right. Yeah. And I started the training videos beforehand. Made notes from November. Gave me a lot of insight and in what to expect. Then once the case study was released in December, I spent a good while just reading and reading and reading. I made sure that. I knew my case to the inside and out even before I looked at the solutions. Did you feel the urge when you're reading the case study to kind of, you know, lots of people get go into solution mode very quickly. Did that happen <laughs> to you? Did you kind of feel the urge to think, oh, yes, they need a pension. Oh, yes, I need to do that. Oh, I need to think about that. Um, no, I'd be lying if I said no, um, <laughs> given the financial planner in me. Um, and I started to make notes. I literally printed off a few copies of a case study and you know, annotated all over it and um, penciled my thoughts. And as I read it through a bit more, I iterated on the solutions. But I think one thing is really important not to be too dead set with the solutions because it's a 3D jigsaw, as you say, and whatever you write down at the start will change. Mm. Yeah. Um, and you need to have the structure in place to be able to go back and change the solutions. Um, I spent a lot of my time getting my spreadsheets and all the analysis done before the write-up. I think if you have your spreadsheets, you know, tip top, the actual write-up is actually quite easy because you're just articulating your own workings that you've been working on, right? Yeah, absolutely. And most people tell me that it probably takes about six to nine hours to write the case study up once you know what your solutions are. Mm-hmm. Would you mm-hmm. would you go along with that? Absolutely agree. The actual write-up did not take very long at all um, because if you have conviction in your spreadsheets and your analysis, and, which underpins all of your solutions, the write-up, yeah. a few hours just to articulate that in an easy to way and easy to understand way absolutely absolutely <laughs> and so what um so how long do you think it took you from start to finish so from starting the videos before your case study arrived mm-hmm. right through to you submitting your first submission for the assessment Oof, a lot so i started my journey it was beginning of January and probably average about two and a half hours a day wow. into January and then the first week of February so say well, what, about 10 week block so that's 70 days ish at two and a half hours about 175 hours in total wow yeah now on top of that for me anyway it becomes all consuming you know out walking or driving constantly thinking about it mm. um it never really stopped. So in total, it probably you know, around the 200 hour mark. I think that's quite normal. I was talking to Daniel Ryan, who did a podcast the other day, and he said, including talking to his wife in the kitchen about it, and she was absolutely pig sick of these clients by the end of the 10 week period. He reckons it took him probably two, 200 to 250 hours even. Yeah, I, I can get behind that. Um, I, you know, my partner has no interest in financial planning whatsoever and just trying to <laughs> through to her constantly. Um, 
she probably knew the clients more like more than anyone else yeah and um, it's quite funny what really helped with all of this though is setting a study timetable and sticking to it yeah um yeah. it's something i've done throughout more exams especially over christmas period yeah, it's really important for me to do CFP, but life is for living and spending moments with your cherished ones. Um, yes. Having a plan meant I could actually have a beer over Christmas with my family and not feel guilty over it. Yeah. Um, the flip side is, you know, pre and post Christmas, you have to really knuckle down. Absolutely. And all the more important for the people who are on the course right now, if anybody who's got their case study <laughs> right now, then they need to get a wiggle on. And if they haven't got a plan in place... <laughs> <laughs> Definitely get one in place. Get one in place quickly. And so looking back over that process, um, mm. you, were there any particular issues that you found either with the case study or, you know, with working your solutions, uh, the spreadsheets perhaps? Where where were, you know, the major kind of sticking points for you? I think the hardest thing is the 3D element. Um, I felt good with my assumptions early on which helped, um, but you soon realize that objectives may be conflicting and impact one section. For example, there might be a certain retirement objective and by the time you get down to it, care implications may go out the window. Yeah, That means you have to go back and revise the spreadsheets accordingly, which you know, if you change a spreadsheet at the beginning, it runs through until the end. Um, you might have, say, some surplus income, which could then impact pension contributions, may impact protection, affordability needs, etc. cetera. Um, it's a constant juggling act. Uh, mm. I know you're a fan of having different tabs with a spreadsheet. For me, it really helps to separate it out onto different workbooks. Yeah. For example, I'd have my base as, say, a spreadsheet V1, V1 solution, which I'd go through. By the time I'd get to a certain section and realise, hang on, I need to go back and change my solution, I'd save that as a V2 and carry on that way. The downside to that is I ended up with a lot of spreadsheets. So if you try this route, I would recommend having a good filing system or coding methodology. Yeah. Um, being systematised in this way really helped overcome the ongoing problem because I could yeah. just refer back to a previous version, jump in, adapt where necessary. Yeah. And I think you've got to be careful that you label these things correctly, like you say, to have that system in place, because, you know, you, there's only so many characters you can get on the tabs at the bottom as well, isn't there? You can yep. easily go back and actually jump into the wrong one, can't you, if you're not careful? Yeah, absolutely. And what helped me, I had a master cover sheet. I think it was just on a separate um, Excel workbook where... I put notes on what each tab or each workbook referred to and what the differences were. So if I ever got confused or in that mess, I could quickly refer to my key sheet okay. and jump straight back in accordingly. Fantastic tip. Um, did you, So I guess, were you quite au fait already with Excel spreadsheets before you started the course and started gaining your, you know, to gain your um, level seven assessment pass? Yeah, I, I'd say so. Um I um, I really like when you get into the deep nitty gritty of Excel modeling, yeah, which definitely helped. Um, but as ever, you can always learn and adapt and improve. Yeah. So your training videos on some of the Excel functions were a really good refresher for me. So going through the course, I definitely recommend either learning or refreshing yourself on it. Um, because when yeah. it comes to the implementation of the case study it's really useful to be on top of those skills yeah and so you passed on your very first submission didn't you <laughs> i did that was also a very very nervous way thank you <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic that's absolutely fantastic news i mean you must have been so pleased after putting all that work in um and yep. you know as you say surprised a little maybe but um but still pleased yeah, I was over the moon. Um, years of work and dedication and sacrifice into this one moment, trying to hit my goal and objectives. It was, yeah, it was, it was a great moment for me. Yeah, that's fantastic. And so now you've had a little bit of time, just a few months, six months or so, <laughs> uh, since you got your results now to reflect mm -hmm. on how has it changed you as a financial planner? Has it changed the way that 
you talk to clients or the way that you look at financial plans at all? Um, honestly, no. And at face value, that may seem really strange. The reason for which is that when I was at Brooke Dobson Breer, the CFP way was ingrained in me from the start. So from my perspective, I didn't know anything different other than the CFP way of doing it. Yeah. And it was only until relatively recently I found out others don't do it this way, which absolutely blew my mind. Um, from my perspective, I don't know how you can do anything other than for financial planning. Yeah. However, what it's all well and good hearing and seeing it, but the validation of actually going through the CFP course was great for me. It gave me a lot of conviction that the way I think and the way I go about things is genuinely the best thing for a client. Yeah. Yeah. And do you use proprietary software at Mercury? Um, do you mean by cash flow? Yeah. Yeah, we do. Um, which is quite an interesting point, actually. Just as I was going through my CFP journey, I was listening to all your podcasts through. And I think you had Alistair Walker on one episode. Yes. Who he spoke quite a lot about using cash flow model or not using cash flow model for the CFP. Um, and I had a good chat with him. I back myself with my cash flow modeling skills, but I didn't quite fancy the gamble of taking that on with the market and using a, you know, a voyant or a truth um, output for my CFP. Yeah. So you went with the Excel format. <laughs> I did. I did in the end. Um, I, I don't know if many people do use truth or voyance, but yeah. Uh, well, I've come across the, the odd, probably about half a dozen people over the last two years have used uh, truth or voyance. And every single person has fallen into the same camp as Alistair, that yeah. basically saying that he wished that he had started with Excel for the very mm -hmm. first assessment. Um, and most people say that they feel that they wasted their their first assessment by using some sort of proprietary software. Mm, um, but yeah, I guess I if you think about it logically, those pieces of software aren't designed to meet the CFP. They're designed to be more user-friendly for, you know, use in front of clients, aren't they? They're not actually yep, designed right. with the international certification in mind. So I guess if you think about it from that point of view, it's fairly logical um, that it wouldn't meet it, um, you know, as a natural, you know, fallout mm -hmm. from, mm -hmm. you know, inputting client data. Yeah, I think that's key as well and something I had to get my head around because at first I was frustrated. Why can't I use this piece of software that I am familiar with at back and I know how to use? But as you say, the truth of voyant is not designed for the CFP and international accreditation. Um, mm. It's client friendly. It's yeah. used for in in meetings, not for the CFP. So once you get your heads around that and use that logic, it you know, eases the blow, I guess. Yeah. And do you think that going through using Excel spreadsheets for the level seven has allowed you or given you a slightly different insight into um, you know, proprietary software like Voyant or Truth, that when you use it perhaps in front of clients, that either gives you more confidence or maybe helps you find where, you know, something's gone a bit wonky with the system mm -hmm. or something like that. And you think, oh, I'm not quite, can't put your finger on it. But does it does it help give you that kind of second sense of that something might not be quite right with a financial plan? Yeah, I'd say so. Um, you know, as with any software, it's a tool. So it's not the be all and end all. It's based on a set of assumptions. Now, whenever I'm modeling, particularly after all the work we've done and using the Excel spreadsheets for my CFP, constantly when I was looking at my spreadsheets, I had in my mind what I would be expecting. Now, <laughs> naturally, there were times when I got a number completely left field and it was so skewed. And that, you know, it made me investigate. Obviously, there's a rabbit off here. Let's go have a look at what's happening. Yeah. Um, and go digging and find out there's a comma missing in some formula, um, <laughs> which is always fun to put right. Absolutely. But absolutely. <laughs> it, it helps so much in a client meeting because now I've got a sense of, I have a rough idea of what I'm expecting with the modeling. So if something is off or the output is different, I have the skills now to be able to go digging and find out there and then when you're in front of a client in a live scenario, it's a whole different amount of pressure. Yeah, yeah. 
it's really interesting, isn't it? Doing something like this assessment and then taking it into the real world and kind of asking yourself, well, you know, how can I improve as a financial planner? Mm -hmm. How can I improve, you know, maybe the systems and back office processes in place, Mm -hmm. you know, to be able to, even if the answer is, well, no, I can't. And, you know, certainly in some quarters, but, you know, maybe there are, for all of us, there are takeaways, aren't there, that this can help us, you know, give better quality advice in the future. Absolutely. There is so much value in the CFP process and I couldn't speak, you know, I can't speak more highly of it, Um, even if it's some sort of validation of what you're already doing or changing your way of thinking or processes in the back office. Um, I, I encourage every financial professional to undertake the CFP. Um, the benchmark's high for a reason. It is difficult. There's you know, be under no disillusion over that. It is hard, but it's supposed to be um, yeah. for a good reason as well. Yeah. Well, the level seven is master's degree level, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, that's the kind of level of difficulty that we're looking at. Yep. It, it is hard. And like you say, it's that sort of level. So it has to be. Um, but it sets you out above the rest. Um, it's a really good differentiator and can and does improve your skills as a financial planner and make you more relatable to client scenarios and client outcomes, which is what everyone wants. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating stuff. So we are nearly at the end of our interview today. And I just wanted to ask you whether you had any tips for that you could share for people who are either in the middle of the CFP process at the moment, or maybe who are thinking, right, 2024 is going to be my year and I am going to embark on that process. What mm-hmm. would you say to them? Um, it can It can be really daunting to start the process, especially if you're you know, right at the beginning. I mentioned it at the start, but break it down and set out a plan. As I would say to a client, it's, you know, you walk out the door, financial plan's basically out of date, but the art of planning itself goes a long way. Um, The plan or your study plan will likely go out the window as life materializes and things crop up. But having that structure and being realistic about it helps. Um, If you haven't studied before or find it hard, give yourself a bit longer. And don't compare yourself to those who get through it in a very quick time. It's about your individual journey, not what someone else has been through. Mm. Yeah. And it really is an individual journey, isn't it? Because we all work at a different pace. We take information on, depending on our past experience. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody's their own person and you've got to recognise that. Yeah, absolutely. In comparison, a thief of joy. Um, so do what you can in your remit um, and don't try and compare yourself to someone else. Um, a second tip I'd also say is that if you want to do it and really actually do it, make sure you commit yourself and live and breathe it if you want to get anywhere near to the top. Is it going to be for everyone, especially as you get towards the latter stages, which is absolutely fine, but You know, give it all your effort. Otherwise, you're just going to be unfair on yourself and those around you who see you studying in the corner and, you know, distancing yourself from all the fun events, putting the hard yards because there's no substitute for it. Yeah. And then lastly, I'd say just enjoy the journey and realize that exams are only part of the parcel of being a financial planning professional. I was probably a little bit guilty of this myself. If you focus only on the end game, I'm not going to say disappointed because you should never be disappointed with attaining the CFP, but it can be a bit of a, not not even anticlimactic, but if you focus on the end journey, you, you're just not going to enjoy it on the way or you're not going to enjoy it as much. Um, focusing on the present makes it more pleasant. You never know what doors will open. Um, I, following my exam journey, I've been invited onto the exam panel for level six, which I never thought in a million years this would happen when I set out. And now I'm having a lot of real meaningful say into the future of exams and getting to do it with some like-minded and very bright people, which is great to just be around. 
It's a fantastic journey that you've been on, Annick. Um, I'm really grateful for you to come on today and share your journey with us all. Um, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you and congratulations again on passing your certified financial planner on the first assessment. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Jackie. I appreciate that a lot. And thank you for all your help. Um, you know, our chats were so valuable. I couldn't recommend, recommend you highly enough. Thank you. That's very kind. It's really interesting, isn't it, to listen to different people who have different experiences of gaining their certified financial planner certification or maybe developing the financial planning profession at large. If you know anybody who you think might be interested in listening to any of these podcasts, then please do pass on our details. That's it for me. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode. See you again soon. Bye for now.